But we begin with this top story, the ongoing chaos and crisis at the border. Donald Trump's acting Border Protection Commissioner says he's leaving his post. This comes as the outcry builds over these conditions that detained migrant children are facing, including at one specific facility in Texas where there was reportedly no access to showers, toothbrushes, and even basic food. Today, over 100 children who had been removed from that center were then returned there. The New York Times report tonight, no additional resources have been provided to the children who were sent back. Today, Donald Trump responded to reports of these conditions by name-checking his predecessor. Are you personally concerned about the conditions at these border facilities? Yes, I am. I'm very concerned. Uh, and they're much better than they were under President Obama, by far. That's simply not what we're hearing from reporters on the ground or experts. In fact, in a moment, I will get reaction to all of that from the person who literally ran ICE under the Obama administration, so we can talk to people who know things about these claims. But I want to give you a little more context before we get there. This fight is also exploding in the Congress. There are protests outside of lawmakers' offices all day today. Later tonight, the House moving towards a vote on a bill that would address the conditions for some of these children. Immigration attorneys who visited that same Texas facility describe it as, quote, appalling. Most of the children who I met with haven't had any opportunity to bathe or shower since crossing the border. One of the things that we hear a lot is just about the stench. Diseases are spreading. There's also a lice infestation. I'll talk about how hungry they are. These are the most appalling conditions I have seen in my 12 years of representing children and families who are detained. That's an eyewitness account. I'm joined now by New York Times columnist Michelle Goldberg, who was just on the campaign trail in South Carolina, Jason Johnson, politics editor for The Root, and Congressman Adriano Espaillat of New York and a member of the Hispanic Caucus. A good evening to each of you. Thanks. Good evening, good evening Gary. Uh, Congressman, on the news, uh, your view of Donald Trump's claims and what you're seeing in your own house, is there going to be a successful vote tonight? I think we will have a successful vote. This crisis has a label, and the label says, made by Trump. Uh, we can no longer wait around and now bring immediate help to the children. And while not perfect, uh, this supplemental bill will get the resources necessary uh, to help the children out at the border. Uh, many figures are being thrown around, but the, un the only number that really matters to me and many of us is the number seven. That's the number of children that have died at the border. And we must not allow one more child to die at the border. Michelle, I, I want to get your views of where we are. It is Donald Trump's panic button to hit Obama. Uh, he does a lot of things, as we've reported, where he wants to draw the contrast. Obama made an Iran deal, so he unmade it. Uh, but when he's really in trouble and he knows it, uh, on this issue that was supposed to be his strength, he seems to say, wait, anything you don't like, it was the other guy. Right. And in this case, it's just blatantly false. I mean, it's certainly true that Obama did things that people on the left and immigration advocates didn't like. He had family detention, you know, as opposed to child separation. There were a few cases of child separation, but they were sort of, it wasn't, it was never a policy. It was cases where, for example, the parent was being in, taken into custody for some other sort of crime or where the parent was a provable danger to the child. But yeah, he always sort of wants to blame other people for these crises of his own making. And to be clear, I'm not saying that he made, that, that the creation of this flow of migrants is his own crisis. But you see this with everything that Donald Trump has to um, manage or handle, right? It's just a logistical catastrophe. In the same way that rebuilding mm -hmm. um, Puerto Rico was a logistical nightmare, right? It's the job of these people to do simple things, like get it, like making sure that there are adequate supplies at these facilities where they're going to be holding children. Yeah, you, you, you say that, and it's so important. Jason, I wonder about that aspect of it. Uh, there's a humanitarian and ideological part, which we've been covering and will continue to do so. Um, but what Michelle is raising is also something that has to do with whether you take governance seriously uh, and whether your goal is X number of migrants into the country or Y number and those shift and Obama did do some crackdowns but nothing like this uh, in its chaos or its treatment of children. Um, but X or Y is different from whether you actually have an organized system and the reports we're seeing there was a headline out of the New Yorker late today saying ICE agents are frustrated uh, with how chaotic it is. There's a part of this that has to do with how unprepared the administration looks to be in charge of this federal system. 
Well, Ari, this, this goes back to Steve Bannon, right? The idea of making government chaotic in order to make it easier to eventually tear it all down. Mm. This is that classic phrase of it's not a bug, it's a feature. This is not because the Trump administration doesn't have enough smart people to figure out how to do this. This is because they thrive in chaos. The more chaotic, the more dangerous, the more problematic this entire system seems, they believe that, number one, ultimately, it would allow them to engage in all sorts of illegal and unethical behavior behind the scenes that we're not paying attention to. For example, at the end of last year, where they gave ICE the ability to eliminate any and all complaints against them within six weeks so that no one else can investigate, or possibly now moving some of the immigrant families into DOD facilities so that reporters can't get there. They can do all of these things under the cover of chaos. So that's what the point of this is. They don't want to know how to do this better because it's working the way they want it to. Mm. Congressman, do you agree with that? I agree. Uh, he's, you know, the, we saw how the border, the, the border patrol chief uh, uh, resigned today and uh, total chaos. And this is not helping matters. This is putting children in peril. This is putting children in danger. And that's why passing this bill tonight would allocate the funding to bring about, uh, about supplies to the border to ensure that, that they adhere to the Flores decree. All of these things that are important, the mechanical pieces on how uh, these children are received and treated will be addressed by funding, and he has not been able to do that. It continues to be chaos at the border uh, because he's not providing a humane treatment to these children. And as, as a result, we've seen several of them die. Yeah, you, you, you mentioned the, the deaths. You mentioned the reports of the treatment, mistreatment. Uh, I want to play one of your colleagues, a member of Congress, because a lot of this seems to really revolve around facts. The facts that are getting out, the accounts that we're getting from people who are close to it, from advocates, as well as independent reporters, as well as what Jason mentions, which is uh, even a hobbled uh, whistleblower system. But we're getting a lot of facts about what it looks like. Uh, it doesn't look good. Uh, here's how one of your colleagues put it, though, uh, counter to the facts, making a, a rather bizarre claim that these kids could leave any time. Take a look. I've been to Casa Padre in, in Brownsville, Texas. Yes, it's a restored Walmart. You know what? There's not a lock on the door. Any child is free to leave at any time, but they don't. And okay. you know why? Because they're well taken care of. Is that true? Unreal. Unreal. I've been down to the border myself. I've seen the mother sleeping on the floor with their children, packed like sardines, inhumane. I saw the room where Jacqueline Cow was treated before she died. You know, a flat uh, table. Uh, a, a supply cabinet with bandages and gauze, no real equipment nor uh, medical uh, services available for, for her and that's, uh, in that time of crisis. That's so, what you uh, saw. So is your, is your Republican colleague, in your view, uninformed or, or lying? Look, I'm, look, it's certainly not what's going on down there. I've been down there. He's misrepresenting what's going down there. Seven, peop seven children have died. We want to prevent one more death. And that's why we're passing this bill. Now, the, the, the president is going ahead and saying that he's, he's not going to support this bill. The American people, the vast majority of the American people in, in poll numbers show that immigration is their top concern. And the vast majority of them feel that children should not be separated from their families, that dreamers should be given a shot to stay in the country, and that these children yeah. should not be kept under these conditions. The American public has a big heart. The president is not seeing that. And obviously, this person down at the border, my colleague, isn't either. Uh, Congressman, appreciate getting your perspective. I know you have the vote Thank tonight. You so Thank you for coming on the beat, sir. Thank you, Ari. Absolutely. Our coverage continues. Our panel stays, and I want to bring in John Sandwig, who served as acting director of ICE under the Obama administration. This was in the period around 2013, 2014. Thanks for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, let's get to the facts here. Number one, why are these problems getting worse, including the treatment of children uh, that you see under this, under this administration? Well, a big part of this is the management of this crisis that the administration has undertaken. We have them cutting off aid to Central America, which is a critical component to stop the flow. Uh, and we have them continuing to apply this deterrence-based approach where we're going to try to tough our way out of this, when the fact is we cannot make conditions tougher on this side of the border than they are with the people are facing in Central America, where you're looking at the highest murder rates uh, and governments, that, you know, no economic opportunity and governments that are incapable of keeping their people safe. And your so, view, just to just pause on that point, is that they are deliberately trying to make it harsh or painful here. That's certainly part of the strategy, right? It's a detention-based approach. Listen, you got 300 kids sitting in a, in a facility that was built for adult males, and candidly, 
built only to detain adult males for a very short period of time. Kids have no business there. Why are they there? In large part because the administration is engaged in what, a quasi form of family separation where if a child is coming across with someone who's other than their parent, it could be an aunt, it could be an older brother, they are separating them ostensibly out of fear of, mm. you know, that they're being trafficked. But in large part, this is an effort to defeat what they believe is an effort by smugglers to game the system by creating fake families. All of this is compounding the problem. None of it, most importantly, is solving the problem, which can only be solved with more resources uh, surging into HHS and more immigration judges to quickly process these asylum claims you, so people who don't do have good claims can go home. Do you think the Trump administration is wrong about their view of, of what the smugglers are doing uh, regarding bringing children in and families in? There's certainly some of that, for sure. Uh, absolutely. And listen, that's something you have to be very sensitive to and very, very, you know, attentive to try to detect that. The problem here is you have families that, you know, in situations where it is families, it's just not an immediate family member. Uh, and so you have two choices. You either, one, let them, you know, basically release them through the normal process, screen them, check them for criminal histories, do all of your investigations, make sure they don't pose a health risk, uh, and then put them into deportation proceedings where they can go see a judge. Right. Typically, they will reunite with their family. And what, you're, you what you're talking separate. about, just to slow you, you're, you're running through it so fast, I want to slow you down. Sorry. But what you're, no, don't be sorry, I'm just saying, what you're talking about is, again, whether or not the, the dial is up or down, a responsible process that honors, tries to honor the human rights and the due process rights of these individuals. Uh, because you and the Obama administration took criticism from some uh, for your deportations, your crackdowns. What we are describing that seems to be a big difference, what we've, what we've reported, is whether that's done through the due process system or, or against it. Uh, and so I want to give you as well the benefit, uh, the, the president took a shot, as I mentioned repeatedly, uh, at the Obama administration, which really is at you. You were charged of ICE for part of this. Take a look. We've ended separation. You know, under President Obama, you had separation. I was the one that ended it. Now, I said one thing. When I ended it, I said, here's what's going to happen. More families are going to come up, and that's what's happened. But they're really coming up for the economics. But once you ended the separation, but I ended separation. I inherited separation from President Obama. He's talking about your department uh, that you ran. Uh, is that true or not? All right, that's categorically false. Uh, there was no family separation under the Obama administration. In fact, the policy was the exact opposite. Do everything we can to keep families together to the point where we even paroled back into the United States parents so they could reclaim their children. I, I don't know why he keeps saying that. It is categorically false. Uh, Jason, I want to play for you as well uh, another Another ICE leader, you know, this is what's in the news now, is who's in charge of ICE and how do they talk. This is the incoming one in a DHS that I think it's very fair to say uh, has been just ripped up by chaos at the, at the leadership level. Uh, the use of these acting directors, the, the real lack of a plan, uh, as we've been reporting throughout tonight. Here's uh, one of the new ones serving Donald Trump making, making the case. Take a look. A judge has given them a final order of removal, which they are not complying with. I've asked them to come to ICE. I don't want to send ICE agents to their home or work, but they refuse. They won't come to us and work with us to, to in, in, a, in a humane, compassionate way, remove them to their country. We have no choice to get them. Uh, that's the ICE director. And Jason, again, I try to be as careful, fair as I can here, but it seems to me that he's going on Fox News today and he's blaming uh, migrants for what, what he refers to as uh, they won't work with us in a humane, compassionate way. So we have to act like this. He seems to be blaming them uh, for what he elliptically acknowledges as a lack of compassion. Right. Well, Ari, this is evil. It, it, it's, it's just plain evil. It is a human rights violation at every single level, and it's masquerading as administrative failure. The fact of the matter is, ICE, if they actually kept their paperwork together, they would be able to communicate with these families on a regular basis, but they don't. They either catch and release, separate the families, or leave people in absolute limbo so they don't even know who to communicate with. So to turn around later and say, well, I have no choice but to kick down the door, wave in a 4-4, and drag your whole family out is an indicator of the lack of empathy on the part of this administration. And anyone, whether they're working in ICE or a member of Congress or even local legislators down there that justify these human rights abuses and the deaths, we have an administration that is arguing against giving toothpaste to children. Anyone who advocates this kind of behavior is evil as well. It is an absolute blight on the history of this country. Mm. Michelle, uh, Jason, putting it unsparingly, uh, and I want to talk about uh, the reporting, as I mentioned, about 
what is happening. This is uh, from Vox, just walking us through where we got to, which mm -hmm. uh, uh, former ICE Director John Samick was just referring to. The problem is not, they write, this very controversial Texas facility. It's this hastily cobbled together system of facilities the Trump administration has thrown together in the last several months as the unprecedented number of families and children coming to the U.S. without papers has overwhelmed the system design to swiftly deport single adults. Uh, the point that Mr. Sagra made about why you shouldn't put kids in those facilities in the first place. Right, and just to make a quick point, that um, the, the man we just saw speaking on Fox is now the one who is going to take over the system right. of, um, you know, sort of baby jails, basically, that they're using because they can't process people out into the HHS system fast enough. You know, so just today, the the, the head of, um, the acting head of Customs and Border Patrol resigned. That guy is moving over to take the job, right? So you see this huge amount of turnover even in the midst of this crisis. But indeed, the problem is that none of these, you're not supposed to be under the, um, Tenants of the Flores Agreement, which was this yep. settlement in about kind of how long you can hold children. None of these kids are supposed to be in detention for more than 72 hours. They're supposed to be moved very quickly into HHS, into the Office of Refugee Resettlement. And the fact that there is a lot of people coming at the border is just not an excuse for failing no. to do that, right? I mean, the reason right. a, a president, any president, has crises and is tested by unexpected events. And yeah. your failure to rise to the occasion can't be justified by the fact that those events were unexpected. So I think it's, I don't know that we, I think it's probably a combination of malice and incompetence, but, and, and I think it's also important to note that we know about this particular facility because it was being investigated, um, you know, for its compliance with the Flores Agreements. We have no idea how many other facilities out oh, there that are, are, glad, are like that, that yes. are kind of where I'm, children exactly. are being held in similar squalor. No, and that's why we're zeroing in on what, what we can learn and what we have factually. And mm -hmm. also to your point, Michelle, we only know about them denying soap and blankets uh, as a legal claim because they've been fighting to not have a monitor oversee a certain facility. So this is, uh, sadly, I think for those who care about uh, the treatment issues, this is, this is just a, a slice of the picture. Michelle, Jason, and John, uh, thanks to each of you for this important conversation. I'm gonna